CGTN, China Global Television Network. Kenyans go to the polls in the coming week. Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta will go up against former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. But there are many issues that could sway the Kenyan voter. So what exactly are these issues and how will they decide the outcome of this election? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Well, Kenya's election is making regional and international headlines. Let's get more perspective on what's going on in Kenya. And I'm joined by Rafael Obonio. He's a convener from the Youth Congress. I'm also joined by Dr. Alex Owiti, Director, East Africa Institute, Aga Khan University. Uh, Dr. Peter Kagwanja, he's the CEO, Africa Policy Institute. And Daisy Amdani, she's the ED Cron Trust. Welcome, all of you, to the program. I'll start off with you, uh, and I want to get your key issues uh, uh, first of all because this is Kenya's fourth multi-party uh, election and it, it is moving um, at a rather dramatic speed uh, mm -hmm. this time around. In your view, what are the key issues that are emerging in this election? I think for, first of all, uh, I mean election is an important moment for us to sort of have a transition uh, when it comes to, to leadership. But for these particular elections, I think for me the key issue is uh, youth. Uh, we look at uh, youth in terms of being the largest demographic in, uh, in, in the country. 80% of the population of, of Kenya is below age, uh, age 35. So if you look at it in terms of demographic, then we talk uh, youth becomes a major factor. If you look at it in terms of the voting block, 51% according to the, the electoral agency, 51% uh, of the, the, the registered voters are right. actually young people. That's a voting block that is required. But then the third thing which is important is the voting issues. Uh, especially for young people, so that young people are not just numbers, but what are they looking, uh, l l looking up to? I think the question of youth and employment. So young people are hoping that the leadership that is going to come on, uh, on board will address the question of, uh, of uh, things like unemployment, things like uh, education, you know, things like uh, affordable health care, and all that stuff. And so uh, asking young people to register to vote is one thing, but asking them to uh, sort of identify the issues why they are voting is right. actually important, and that's why we are saying youth uh, should look at youth what issues is on the are top of the agenda. Dr. Yes. Awiti, your take. So, what I think is that this is a, this could have been a consequential election in many ways because the country has an opportunity to make fundamental evaluations of the past four years. Uh, this is the first inside four years of implementing a new constitution, looking at uh, devolution: what has worked, what hasn't worked. What are the intergovernmental relations between the counties and the national government? Are we close to a joint government? Uh, the fundamental questions about the, uh, the economy, especially the debt question, uh, the GDP debt ratio. There are many arguments that can be made about fiscal management that uh, needed to have been made in this election. Uh, they are consequential going forward. Some of the uh, projections that I've seen uh, suggests that we still need a huge financial outlay to, to just rig the infrastructure that we need to drive the economy forward. Uh, so the real questions really are about the welfare dividends of the growth that we've seen today. Right. Where is that dividend? Where is that dividend? That ties in with the youth and employment and the yeah. that demographic. Dr. Kagwanya, your take? I am a little bit more optimistic uh, in the sense that uh, the, the economy that has emerged from 2002 and which seems to be uh, growing that direction favors the youth other than the old generation. Uh, agriculture is declining, but this economy, for example, in Kenya and Africa generally, is IT driven. Uh, this economy is communication driven and the people who are basically able to get there are the young people. I, I think the, this election itself is going to be decided by the youth. Right. And the issue facing, the, uh, the, the issue really determining uh, whether they would tilt the balance in one side or another is about how they feel about their future and which political formation is going to inspire their imagination about a brighter future. Because as we stand now, we're facing the, the, main, the main problem of contradiction of globalization, which is basically a very fast growth and uh, in, uh, that's which uh, Dr. Witt has talked about, 
and very little trickle effect on, right. the, on the society. We're going to look at that uh, trickle effect and a uh, few key issues are emerging here that the economy despite the growth of the economy over the last four years though the trickle down effect is not being felt but first let's get your view Daisy. Well for me my um, perspective for this election is how women are performing because when we talk about um, envisioning a new Kenya, that's what we did in 2010. And one of the integral parts of that 2010 constitution in envisioning a new Kenya was the inclusivity principle with women being included in leadership and decision making. And it's been an uphill task in terms of being able to get the necessary legislation to guarantee that exclusion. But having said that, we've seen some strides that women have made um, in uh, the especially uh, during the nomination process and we have women vying uh, you know for governorship and uh, it's a very exciting time because before we didn't see that kind of uh, showing by women and so everybody's really looking out how many governors are we going to get who are going to be controlling county budgets but having said that and um, even though uh, uh, Dr. Kagwanja speaks of declining agriculture that is also one of the areas that we are very concerned about and that needs to be addressed also within the the political discourse at this time and the issue of food security is a major problem because we've had serious food shortages and a, r a disconnect between uh, policy and outputs you know and this for us is very concerning as women because 80 percent of the labor force right. in the agricultural sector is actually provided by women and so the poverty rates that we see there are so high so how then do we integrate women into that uh, into the growing economy but also focusing on agriculture because while we speak about ICT driven and technology driven let's not forget that people must eat people must eat so you need to have a guarantee of food security so how then do we integrate women into those chains to ensure that women become key a key uh, component of right. food security in Kenya. Looking at the, the issues that have been raised here, and, and we often tend to look at um, Kenya's position um, in isolation here, but in comparison though with the region, and I'll start here with your youth mm -hmm. unemployment, in comparison with the region uh, in terms of Kenya's unemployment figures, which according to the World Bank stand at about 22.2% uh, compared to like, let's say the big economies mm -hmm. like uh, South Africa, Nigeria, or Egypt, is Kenya uh, unemployment rate extremely high or in comparison? Amongst the youth, I think uh, un 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 unemployment in Kenya is much higher compared to other, uh, I mean, the neighboring countries, whether you talk of Rwanda, Tanzania, or even 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 uh, even Uganda. But Kenya has also come up with models to address uh, youth unemployment in some way. You know, we have a youth fund, which is... Uh, uh, acclaimed as one of the most uh, innovative kind of a, of a program within uh, within the region and a couple of others. But I think our problem comes in uh, we create hope but it's false hope because we have good models but we never make them work for young people. So while uh, we can tackle unemployment, the programs that we've created have been uh, sort of mismanaged, you know. Uh, leadership of those programs do not necessarily have youth at heart or youth issues at, uh, at heart. Right, Dr. Kagwanya, you did talk about youth being the future. Yep. Uh, for Kenya though, do you agree? Yeah, I, I, do, I do agree in, in a sense um, um, that um, youth unemployment in Kenya could be higher in the sense that Kenya's population has grown faster than the neighbors. If you look at the, 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 the recent growth, there's really a, a, a jumping uh, of, of, the, of the population. And, and, in, and, and of course, you've seen the expansion of the university sector. Uh, particularly in this country, to the point that the uh, University of Nairobi alone is graduating about 16,000 uh, people in a year, uh, 8,000 each of the two uh, graduations. Uh, and that's one out of 67 uh, universities, both private and public, mixed. Now, what that means is that uh, the public sector, as currently constituted, can never accommodate these people. But the, the beautiful thing is that Kenya itself has never been what you can call a public sector economy. It's an informal sector economy. And I think it's how we rejig and uh, kind of uh, revamp the informal sector to absorb this population that's going to, to make a difference. Uh, is that being done? Uh, he, he mentioned the youth funds and uh, other things, but this seems to be more oriented towards the elite among the youth 
right. rather than the, uh, the the ordinary youths who who do not know how to write a proposal, those who do not know how to do a business plan, and so on. Uh, so I think there need to be more flexibility about how to access uh, support for the informal sector. Otherwise, the formal sector is not going to be the future. Dr. Witi. So I, I think we have fundamental structural problems with the economy. Um, if you look at the, uh, the rapid growth since 2002 uh, to date, it's very difficult to appropriate how much of that is from domestic processes of manufacturing value addition. There's been a huge injection of, of, of external capital into the country to drive infrastructural projects. And, and that distorts those numbers. And I, and I think that's why it's difficult to, 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 to see the trickle down that we're looking for. Because capital is stuck on these big, shiny things like uh, roads and railways and ports and harbors. What, what we haven't done, as Desi said, is to figure out a way to create those structures that then enable the economy to work across all sectors. And this is what Africa is struggling with generally. Uh, we talked about Africa rising. Now everybody is wondering, rising for who? Not that uh, rising tide isn't lifting all boats. It's not lifting all boats because we have failed in the imagination of those structural components that will then distribute those growth dividends much more equitably, especially to the rural women. I For instance, some of the work that we've done. Yes, if yes. you go back uh, and, and you're talking about uh, uh, having spent so much on infrastructure, when you look yes. at uh, developing countries and mm. countries that are on the move, though, isn't this a prerequisite for development that you must have it, the it, infrastructure? It is a prerequisite. I'm not saying that we shouldn't spend the money, but what I'm saying is that it, it detracts from understanding the real, the real dynamic of the economy, because then you're stuck at the top end of headline GDP, but you're not looking at the, the, the retail end of that, the everyday uh, person, and, and how much value is created out of these infrastructural projects that then drives domestic value add. So we need to be more imaginative yeah. about how we drive forward the economy. Now, this is where we now need to figure out, does the political process address these fundamental challenges in terms of rejigging the economy, as he put it? I'm going to put that question to Daisy. We've sat here and we are talking issues in this forum. You've talked about your challenges being mm -hmm. about the youth, yours is the economy, and yours is the youth being the future, and you're talking about issues uh, of, of women. Are we not beginning to see an issue-driven electoral cycle, though, in Kenya? Well, we are and we are not. Because one of the things, one of the beauties of devolution is that it is forcing the issues. Because having our leaders at the grassroots with the people has help the people to at least interrogate them to some measure. And we've actually seen protest votes among the electorate at the grassroots level who are completely dissatisfied with the way um, the, the devolved uh, governments and the devolved representatives have actually handled the resources or development in the area. And, and we're going to continue with this discussion mm -hmm. when we return uh, from the break because I want to get your insights into what Daisy is talking about. We'll take a short break here on the program. When we return, we will be interrogating Kenya's elections upcoming. Stay with us. is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. Business in Africa is high After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move, and it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchiyo Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN.
Welcome back to Talk Africa. We are discussing Kenya's upcoming elections. My guest still here with me, uh, Raphael Obonyo, Dr. Alex Awiti, uh, Dr. Peter Kagwanja, and uh, Daisy Amdani. Thank you, Daisy. I want you all to respond to Daisy's uh, view there. Earlier on, she mentioned that Kenya's electoral cycles are ethnically driven, but you have been talking about the youth demographic as being one of the major deciding factors in these elections. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think we've ma we are making a pro I mean progress as a country. If you look at the constitution now, there are many provisions that, uh, that uh, help us to you know, engage uh, as, a matter of, uh, as a matter of right. When you look at in terms of mobilization, it was easy before to just mobilize people based on uh, their ethnic background. Now, I think uh, what we are calling as young people IBM, issue-based mobilization, is coming, getting on board. Why? Because the generation that we're dealing with, our generation, is becoming less and less tribal in the sense that, uh, I mean, there are intermarriages. We care more about opportunities than where where we came from and, and, and all that. So I think moving forward, it will be very difficult for anyone who relies on ethnic mobilization to sail through through politics. You, you, you'll have to convince, especially the young generation, why is it that they should, uh, they should vote for you? But I think the kind of, uh, the, the ilk of politician that we have is still stuck with the ethnic mobilization. And that's why you see things like uh, political party manifestos are released to the public two ma uh, even a month to elections, how can you even interrogate it? How can that even influence your voting? Uh, your voting party. It means that political parties still don't care about um, party manifestos. Right. But electorates are becoming more aware, are becoming more concerned, not just in terms of their ethnic background, but in terms of the issues that uh, that are affecting, yeah, affecting the country. Dr. Awiti. I think uh, oh, my sense is that our best days are ahead, and uh, if you speak with young people across the country, you begin to see that. Um, there's one aspect of our culture which instrumentalizes ethnicity as a mechanism and a vehicle for political competition. But last week we had a chance to speak with young county assembly aspirants in Nairobi uh, from all walks of life. All of these men and women were raised in the slums. They have the pulse on th they, their fingers on the pulse of the issues that affect those communities from garbage collection to unemployment to drugs and, 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 and extrajudicial killing and unlawful incarceration. That gives me hope that this balkanization on an ethnic basis is, 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 is has run its course. And, and I think it <laughs> I'm excited that this election is seminal in that sense. Uh, and when we did the survey in 2014 and asked young people <coughs> what they thought, how they identified themselves, Ethnicity was the least important dimension of their identity. They were first Kenyans, then they were youth, then they were re religious people, right. and then they were members of their family. But we did see uh, an emergence of ethnicity in a much more prominent way in the 30 to 35. So this, uh, this, uh, the question then is, what happens when they grow much older? Maybe by marriage, when you start looking for work, because a lot of our public institutions are still driven that way. But it shows you that we are the v at the very tail end of, of that ethnic uh, regime. I, I want to get a, a bit more of an insight into exactly where Kenya has been standing when it comes to her regional obligations and mm. if there's been any shift or if there's been any change and exactly about the uh, infrastructural uh, developments that have been going on across the region because there have been a few successful intra uh, regional infrastructural initiatives that have come to play. Dr. Kagwanja. I think Kenya is still the, the leader in the region <coughs> and uh, it's likely to be, I mean it's role as a regional powerhouse is likely to grow uh, on several fronts. First, Kenya is still is the, the main economy uh, in both East and Central Africa. In Comesa, of all things, Kenya's main export is petroleum. Uh, get, get a shock, because it's more industrialized, it's more uh, you know, in processing things and so on. So it's, it's, it's going to be a major economy. And there is no indication that it is going to be to have a lesser role uh, in, in that. Uh, not, not necessarily because it has resources. In fact, to be honest, uh, Kenya is now the fourth largest economy in Africa uh, by, by, by recent uh, measurements, and it, it is the, f the only African economy that is not mineral driven. It's not mineral driven. What is driving the Kenyan economy is, is basically uh, the fact that it is interlocked in a very intricate ways with the neighboring economies. 
It also interlocked with the global economy in the sense that many international actors prefer to have their headquarters here, including right. the United Nations. Therefore, in a sense, becoming a kind of a Geneva, a kind of a Switzerland of, of, Afri of Africa. But at the same time, it is increasingly beginning to become a soft power in the sense that the, the difference between, for example, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and Yoweri Museveni of Uganda uh, in the last couple of years was about simply that, because Museveni preferred the hard power in response to South Sudan, that we take our troops and save our friends and that's it. Right. Kenya preferred the way of mediation and joined with the Ethiopia to do simply that. So the point is that what is driving Kenya's uh, regional policy are three things. One, the assert assertiveness of the Uhuru Kenyatta government, and it's, uh, uh, particularly its Pan-African orientation. The second is development orientation, leading the region in terms of that, and that bringing to problem with the Tanzania, which sometimes feels it's being isolated. And finally, it's new resurgent military role in the region, particularly in Somalia. And Sudan. In looking at Kenya's policy now moving forward, uh, whether it's regional or international, though, uh, and I want to start off with you, Daisy, because as we went into uh, 2013, Kenya had begun a policy of looking east right way back to 2003. Give us your view, though, of uh, your thinking of where uh, Kenya will be headed moving forward and that policy starting back from 2003. Well, I think that it has worked for us um, um, in terms of being able to fast track infrastructure development and um, position us better because um, the looking east has allowed our government to access uh, resources and partnerships that are actually working for the benefit of Kenya. I think that it also works, um, it's, it's, it's also um, advantageous to have a diversification of your partnerships. but. One of the things that we don't seem to be tapping into the looking east is how then do we also inculcate or at least transfer some of those skills to our local citizenry? Because that has been the complaint. There seems to be um, um, an overbearing uh, burden, uh, an overbearing where while we look east, the support from the east also comes with uh, skills that are not readily available here in Kenya. And we don't seem to be seeing that skills transfer necessary to ensure a continuity for the Kenyan population. So I think that moving forward, even as we continue with the partnership with the East, I think there are many skills that we must uh, borrow, we must build as Kenyans. And I think that part of that partnership, aside from the financing, I think a key element of that partnership really must be skills, innovation, um, uh, and transformation of, of, of sectors because we've seen what has happened right. in the East that way. When we talk about youth unemployment, one of the crises among the youth is that despite that unemployment, for what is driving the economy, those sectors where we are actually seeing growth, the absence of skills, you know, is a very critical factor. So it would be good if those partnerships also envision inculcating skills among the Kenyan citizenry so that we can move together, so that we begin to see that trickle-down effect and the benefits of the growth that is being driven by the benefits of looking east. Dr. Kagwanja. When it comes to looking east, I think Kenya has greatly uh, balanced between the de 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 declining resources in the west and the increasing resources in the east. And that's why it is among the first uh, to, to have this kind of a railway. Uh, which we've uh, already seen unveiled, the SGR railway. Now, a, a discussion, or a, a kind of a comparison between the SGR in Kenya and, the Thio and Burundi, uh, Djibouti, Ethiopia, is simply that Kenya is more realistic and more pragmatic. You don't want to go to an electric train, uh, whereas you go into an electric train and operate only for three hours, and Kenya can operate uh, around, the, around the clock. The problem with looking east in terms of Kenya is that it is economic centered. I wish they could look at the political structures that have enabled the east to ensure stability uh, in the icon to, to sustain the economy right. or to underpin the economy. The, 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 we are still hanging on this idea that liberalism is the, is the solution to all our problems. And the, and the, the kind of 
anxiety and sometimes uncertainties that we find around, around in Kenya every five years of election. Right. It's, it's basically about that, that we have not found the vital center on which to hang our development. So we are still waving because we think that liberalism is the, the answer to everything. So we're going to wind up in a moment, but I want to get one final comment from all of you very briefly, though, and I'll start off with you, Daisy, though, going into the election, whether it is uh, about Kenya's regional policies, international policies, or domestic policies, what is it as a Kenyan you would like to see? First of all, I would like to see us emerge um, safely from the um, electoral process and um, that moving forward, we begin to see a more inclusive economic growth, that we see a trickle-down effect, integration of women into not just the political spaces, policy and legislative spaces, but also women engaging actively with the economy. Right. Dr. Mm, I have no doubt that this election is going to be uh, peaceful, or that Kenya is going to weather this election, that, that I have no doubt. Uh, the question would be whether, uh, in terms of dealing with whatever incidences that might emerge from this election, uh, Kenya is going to still have the kind of uh, popularity or support it has internationally, particularly on the question of human rights, because that's going to what it's going to be raised. Uh, but I, I, am, I, I can say with the certainty that if uh, when Kenya go over this election, the next five years, uh, we've no doubt it's going to emerge as a major uh, powerhouse, both economic and political. And, and, and I'm very hopeful about that. Right, Dr. Awiti? My expectation and my hope really is, can we come out of this election and focus on the work of the people, building a strong, stable <laughs> economy that produces goods of prosperity that are equally shared? Can we begin the hard work of fixing the unemployment question? Can we slay the ghost of corruption? Can governments, can the two governments that we've created through this constitutional dispensation begin to work much more coherently? Because I think the, where the rubber meets the road is really at the counties. But what you've seen is this antagonistic relationship between these two governments. It's about revenue sharing, how much government do we keep at the central uh, in, in Nairobi, and how much of government do we devolve out there to the communities. I want to see these post-election conversations as, 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 as a <coughs> basis for, for, for relaunching the country going forward. Right, everybody. Uh, Beatrice, for me, I think first I'm excited that uh, Kenya is amongst uh, uh, countries in Africa that are not just uh, talking about the frequency of elections, but the quality of election. We are now more concerned not just about holding elections every five years, but improving the quality. That for me excites me. But two, I just hope that Kenya will continue setting that example that uh, each election helps us to strengthen our democracy and not to destroy it like what we saw in uh, 2007. And so I think we should, uh, uh, as Kenyans, we all have a responsibility to make these elections work for the good of, uh, of our country. Fair, free, fair, credible, and peaceful elections. And lastly, I think it's the question of the youth. I think every uh, five years we see politicians emerging and making pledges and promises to young people, which they never fulfill. They become material for, for elections. I think post-election we want, I think many young people, and young people, Kenya being a youthful uh, country, want to see most of these promises uh, fulfilled in terms of creating opportunities, providing uh, decent uh, uh, jobs, and fixing some of the challenges that affect uh, youth who are actually the drivers of the economy. And we leave it there with the drivers of the economy. Rafael Lobonia, thank you very much for your thoughts. Uh, Dr. Alex Awiti, uh, Dr. Peter Kagwanja, and Daisy Amdani to you all. Thank you for your very insightful discussions here. And we leave it there tonight on uh, Talk Africa. But do follow this conversation on YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. And join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall. Goodbye.